Hello, good afternoon, everyone. You all know, be my now, know me by now. I'm Mathieu Lefebvre, the executive director of the New Cities Foundation. It is with great pleasure that uh, I'm here to introduce our next panel about a very important part of the life of cities. This panel is called Play. We're going to talk about food, we're going to talk about culture, about art, about sports, and what those mean in defining the identity of a city. Few reminders, our hashtag, if you're tweeting, is hashtag NCS2013. Wi-Fi, when you can find it, is uh, NCS2013SP. So enjoy this panel on play, and I'm going to introduce you to our friend Simon Cooper from the Financial Times, who will be leading the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Thanks, everyone, for being here this afternoon. Welcome back. Well, Daniel Liebeskin said in this room yesterday, we all flock to cities that are nice. And a big part of being nice as a city is that you offer your people places to play. And as people work more and more virtually, cities increasingly become places to network and to play. And play means everything from museums to sports, operas, parks, bars, cuisine. And some of the great business centers, like New York or London, are also great artistic cultural centers. So how important exactly is play for attracting residents and investors to a city? And how best can cities turn themselves into places to play, to become more human cities in this way? Well, we have a very global panel here to discuss this. And on my left is Mayor Mike Rawlings of Dallas, and he has a very inspiring urban story of his own. He came to Dallas in 1976 with $200 in his pocket and rose to become CEO of Tracy Locke, the biggest advertising agency in the South then. And later he ran Pizza Hut, of course, the world's biggest pizza company. And then in 2011, he became mayor of Dallas, and a big focus of his work as mayor is on the arts. And Dallas has just completed the biggest urban arts district in the United States. So that's a big part of the city's offering. In the middle, we have Alex Asala, who's been described to me as a global food god. He's a <laughs> Brazilian, and as you see, he wanted to be a punk rock musician. I'm not joking. But he ended up working in restaurants in France and Italy, came back to Sao Paulo, created the restaurant DOM, which is now ranked six best restaurants in the world. And they source ingredients from all over Brazil and uh, often from the Amazon and create a new kind of haute cuisine. Time magazine has also named him as one of its 100 most influential people in the world, so we're very honored. And on the far left is Michael Lynch, who's an Australian, who um, saw the Sydney Opera House being built, and later he ran it as CEO from 1998. Then he came to London and ran the South Bank Center, which um, we Britons think is the most important cultural complex in the world. And now he, um, he's in Hong Kong, where he's CEO of the West Kowloon um, District Cultural Authority, which is embarking on a project even bigger than the South Bank. I'm from Paris, well, I live in Paris, so we're from four continents here today. Mayor Rawlings, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us about how Dallas has turned itself into a more playful place to live and what lessons there might be from other cities in that experience? Love to, why don't we hit a video? Go for it.
show that uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there are some visuals that I might refer to in there. But more importantly, um, a lot of people haven't been to Dallas lately, and they have this sense, uh, this, uh, this kind of corny view, this corny impression of Dallas because of JR. And uh, it's, it's out there in everybody's mind. But it's, it's changed so much in 20 years. Uh, Matthew, who was just up here when he, just, he came this last year, uh, said something uh, very American. He said, I was flabbergasted <laughs> to, uh, to uh, see it and, and see all the things that had taken place. And uh, there's, a, there's a real sense of us growing up. We're a new city. We are a classic new city. We're only um, uh, 160 years old or so. We're built on work. I mean, um, we uh, uh, are the uh, fourth largest SMSA with our sister city, Fort Worth, and Mayor Price is here from Fort Worth as well. Um, SMSA? SMSA, the, uh, the, uh, the kind of the, the sales uh, marketing statistical area, I think, is the, is the correct term. But it's in that, that, that area where we've got six and a half million people, fastest growing in the United States. So there's New York, LA, Chicago land, and Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, and it's built on work. We worked very, very hard. But I think at, at some point we woke up and said to be a great city, we're going to have to play hard too. So, so work hard and play hard. And we went through that. Uh, I was, um, a meaningful moment came to me when uh, we just built a new bridge over our Trinity River. And we could have built any bridge, but we decided to get Santiago Calatrava to build the first uh, bridge in the United States that he had ever done. And uh, it's beautiful, we're very happy with it. But I got to have dinner with him. Wow. And I said to him, we were talking about great cities, we were talking about Paris, and I love Vienna, and, and uh, he's from Spain, and, and I got a little intimidated and said, but you gotta understand, Santiago, we're very young, we're new. And he looked at me and he said, that's the great news. Because what you're gonna be doing over the next 20 years will determine your history for the next centuries. And I thought that was a different way to look at newness. So as we think about play, we're, we're, that's what we're doing. We've done a lot of things. We built this largest um, arts district uh, in the country, um, uh, 70 acres of, of uh, you know, 13 institutions coming together, a great opera house, a great theater center a high school, performing arts high school, Symphony Hall, where we have a, the conductor of the year in America, um, a beautiful museum of fine arts, um, and a sculpture garden that uh, is the envy of New York and Paris. Um, and we've been able to do that, um, but this didn't happen overnight, I, I think. We, we've worked hard at it, we were very planful, committed uh, billions of dollars to this, uh, this enterprise. Um, we wanted to do it for everybody, too. When you look at play, I think you've got to make sure that everybody's involved. Um, kids, we're a big believer that kids should be playing sports, and all the, the um, uh, whether you're a five-year-old girl or a 15-year-old boy, there's something happening in sports all the time. Neighbors need to be involved in the play side of the thing. Different communities, Hispanic or LGBT community. And old people like me need to, need to continue to play. And so we do that. Uh, it starts in sports for Dallas. It really does. Uh, we, love, we love our sport. We've got the largest, you saw the stadium, uh, Cowboy Stadium, which is American football. We've got uh, the largest stadium in the world with the largest TV screen in the world. Uh, and it's amazing to, to go to an event like that. We've got our pro sports. We've got uh, a great uh, Dallas Cup, which is a youth international um, uh, football uh, a tournament uh, that we have. And then we, uh, we've got glamour and nightlife. We're a party town. We love to um, dress up and, and, and go out on the town. Can I just ask, yeah. why? Because as you say, Dallas has been successful as a business city. Why take billions and build something that wasn't there? Um, is, this, is there a business plan to it, as it were? Well, I think there's two aspects of it. One is you look at the cities you want to compete against, and you know that you've got to have institutions of that caliber. I mean, there's a formula of success that we can steal from other people and do that. The second thing is the attraction of human capital. 
whether they're CEOs of large corporations, and we've got 18 of the top Fortune 500 companies based in Dallas. Um, many of the um, um, companies supporting this have their national headquarters in, in the Dallas area as well. Um, and those people want to be part of something. We've got five Nobel Prize winners at our, our, our teaching hospital um, in science, and I asked them why they came here, and they said because we got serious about the arts and things like that. I think that, that helps a, a, a lot. And green space is very important to us. I mean, you, you saw this big at the end, this big green thing, and we've got, uh, we've got a massive uh, 6,000 uh, acre um, uh, Trinity Forest. I mean, I'm, 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 I, I always am blown away by the number. Yeah, 6,000, and that compares to Central Park at 840. So take Central Park and literally, you know, take it by five times, and we've got that right in the middle of uh, Dallas, and so we're we're trying to make sure that uh, that becomes all that it can be, too. So there's a lot of strategy. We put together a plan in the 60s. We put another arts plan together in the 90s. And as mayor, you just kind of grab a baton from the, from the last mayor and run hard and then pass it on. And that's what we've been doing for the last uh, 20 or so years. Thanks very much. Michael, can I just ask you as a follow-up to something the mayor said? Do we have evidence that getting serious about the arts attracts people to a city to come and live there, to come and do business there? Yeah, I think, I think the evidence is, is compelling now that you know, in a, the, the global world we live in, people want to be able to go to cities that are going to work, that are going to be fun, that are, you can play in, that you can eat in. And I, I think you know, the, the origin of the idea of, say, with a place like West Kowloon was looking at cities like Dallas, London, New York, Paris, you know, looking at you know, culturally complex cities and then deciding that a place like Hong Kong was dominated to some extent by its success in finance, hotels, food and shopping. And the consciously they then made a decision to say, we have to change this formula. We will no longer remain the competitor that you know, we need to be to, you know, to mm -hmm. deal with both the, the cities in China, Singapore and a whole range of others. And you know, I, I use my experience experience of Sydney. Um, you know, I, was, I watched the Opera House develop in Sydney from 1959 when they chose the, the architect and then over the course of the, the period up until 1973 when the Opera House opened and then what's happened over you know, the 40 years since then. And Sydney is now, it, it now hits the top six cities in the world for both competitiveness but on you know, most of the other Criteria. I think the, you know, the report that was issued yesterday talked about that. But Sydney has changed fundamentally by virtue of the changing culture. And it's not just the arts, it's, it's also an incredibly vibrant sports culture. But probably, you know, it also is very much the food. Real food, real restaurants, a change from, you know, what it was like when, you know, the 50s and the 60s. And so now, you know, you look at those cities that work, and clearly the one we're in now, Sao Paulo, it, you know, has got a fantastic array of, of different things happening. And, you know, I think that's what makes living in cities great. And, you know, you need to get the balance between, you know, what it's already got, what its history is, and, you know, what's going to make it work into the future. So is this a kind of global recipe then? Should everyone build a, an opera house? Um, <laughs> And I, I, I doubt whether you know, just the idea of the opera house is the way forward. I, I think the mayor's point is that you know, you've got to make the, you know, the arts and the, you know, the culture of a city accessible to people. I think it's got to be seen that you know, there's not you know, ticket prices or entry points aren't there so that people can't share it. You've got to be able to make public space accessible. You've got to be able to hear music inside and outside. You've, you, you know, in a way, um, I think the cities that are making it work are those that you know, are both able to have a, a vast range of activities, but are also able to democratise the experience of being able to share, whether it's the food, the, um, the music, the theatre, even the opera, which tends to be an art form that you know, not many, it tends to be a much more interior art form, although I think you know, one of the things that defines no, the great ex cultural experience in cities is when you can get opera 
and dance and those big experiences outdoors and you know, make them much more broadly accessible. Alex Atala, I'd like to talk to you about food. How important, how does food and great restaurants impact a city? Well, in lots of ways. But uh, first of all, I would like to apologize myself about my poor English. I oh, know. First of all. Second, I'm wearing a t-shirt. And this is means something. First, ATA means the name of the new institute that I made uh, a few months ago. What is ATA? It is a, a, I start to, to work with a, with a native or forgotten or sometimes undiscovered Brazilian ingredients. And this is makes me strong and more know it around the world. This, my relation with the natives and with the Indians and with the small producers in a place like Brazil, in a country like Brazil, uh, uh, takes me lots of time. So I decided that put this out of my restaurant and organize this as an institute. But one more reason. I'm wearing a t-shirt just because I'm a blood guy who works as a chef. I'm not a fancy chef. I'm a regular guy. And this is important because cuisine can be a very important and strong social support. My sous chef, my right arm in the restaurant, is a guy who couldn't finish or maybe he couldn't went to school. 15 years ago, when he started to work with me, he was not able to write or read. Nowadays, 15 years, he's learning English and he's finishing his graduation in a in university. Kitchen can help a lot. Cuisine, restaurants can change dramatically, not only one life, but one entire culture. Cuisine or alimentation is the cross line between culture and nature. This is, this is the, main, the, the main cross line in my personal point of view. When you bring this to a fancy restaurant, this is looks for regular people, something that people can, never can touch. Restaurant, fancy restaurants are not friendly for regular people. That is, and this, this, we must change this. Restaurants is the representation of culture. And people, regular people, workers, must be proud of the, 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 the own culture. So Brazilian cuisine is changing, but the, we, we only can make this affirmation the day when the Brazilian cuisine Honored not for one chef or a few chefs, will be honored for all entire Brazilian people. This is this is this is very powerful message in my personal point of view. Talking about São Paulo, I'm going to tell you a bad history. As a chef, I got a, I made a few beautiful things, and I made, of course, a few bad things as well. One of them, a few years ago, three years ago when I was nominated number seven in the world, uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a special night in Sao Paulo, which we call Virada Cultural, it means a cultural night, like Louis Blanche in, in Paris. All city during the night is dedicated for music, for dance, for all beautiful things that we have. And I decided to make a galinhada. Galinhada is, is, a, is a, a, a recipe, a very traditional Brazilian recipe, who students or drunk people used to make Late at night, <laughs> they stole a chicken in somewhere, and they cooked this chicken and share with people. And we start to make this. Of course, not, we, we didn't still keep the chickens in the restaurant, but, uh, but uh, we start to make this for us, for the staff. After years, this become big, 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 big. And I moved this galinhada from my main restaurant, from my second restaurant, sorry. And from after being nominated number seven, I, I, I got this feeling. I, I would like to share this with Sao Paulo. 
So I made a public galinhada on, on, a, on a minhocão, it's a very traditional place in São Paulo. And it was a disaster, a real disaster. Uh, just to give for you one idea, the main stage have a, a very traditional rock group, Brazilian rock, rock group, uh, and that there's 7,000 people watching this, this beautiful concert. In the Minhocão uh, was more than 5,000, 500, sorry, 5,000 people watching or trying to get Galinhada. It was, it was a mess. I mean, it was a mess. Bad reviews from everywhere, from everywhere. Question is, there is two ways to thinking about it. One, a chef who wants to promote himself and make a store in a city. It's possible. Second, seven or at least five thousands of people, workers, regular people, left home after midnight to taste traditional Brazilian food prepared for a chef. A city like Sao Paulo demanding, really demanding, an event in this proportion. Beautiful thing when the chef left your comfortable position and his restaurant and his comfortable, com 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 comfortable cuisine and serving your fancy customers. Again, it's for just for few people. When we left our comfort zone and we went to, school, to, to, to streets, we put ourselves in the same level that street food. And the food and flavors is the main, again, the main uh, souvenir of trip. When we go to Japan, it's not to taste uh, pizza. If you go to Italy, it's not to, to taste cassoulet. People who come to Sao Paulo want to taste Sao Paulo. Or if you go to Dallas. So this is, can be a huge cultural and social support. Thanks very much. Thank you. Alex has very eloquently raised the issue of who gets to play. And you know, you've, you've built an opera, theatre, arts museum. There must be some tendency for the usual suspects showing up at every performance. And I'm sure you do neighborhood arts projects, but how do you get poorer people into your, your big venues, the ones you really invested emotionally in? Well, I, I, th I think the point that's made overall is, is the point that was made this morning in the session on participation, that the democratization of play is very, very important. And I think there are different venues for different sorts of folks. You've got to have your opera house. We believe in high opera, okay? But that doesn't mean that we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, 30 different operas throughout a year. What we did, to answer your question, take um, uh, the Zabaflut and put it in Cowboy Stadium and put it on the big screen so we had 20,000 people watching opera that night. It was, on, it was on a big TV, but it was a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. So we were able to do that. I think the, the access to tickets and the pricing of tickets is extremely important. Our Museum uh, of Fine Arts broke huge ground this year by opening up, we are free to the public. Free to the public, so you don't have to come in and buy a ticket. The thought is, well, how can you support yourself if you're free to the public? Well, what they find is you get more people excited about the arts, the giving goes up, the special uh, exhibitions happen, so the business model is there. So I think there are techniques, but you've got to continually be driving to a larger customer base. If you go to a smaller customer base, it's not gonna work, and it'll just uh, shrivel up and die. And so I think that's what you did with those chickens that night, you know? That's great. Uh, we did a, uh, one of the most successful events we've done in Hong Kong to just establish the notion of the site that we're on in downtown Kowloon was lunch for 26,000 people, a Chinese form of lunch called a poon choy, where you sit at a table and it's a very similar event. You put all the food into a, um, a burner on the, in the middle of the table and we set the Guinness Book, World Book of Records for lunch. 
<laughs> and, and it was an extraordinary event where you had 26,000 people. I don't think any of them had ever visited our site or had ever shown any interest in you know, the West Kowloon project. But the idea of having lunch uh, together with 26,000 of your mates was a very interesting experience. We put, you know, cu there were cultural events around it, but it's that idea of, you know, f finding the people and saying this place is for you. And I think that's, you know, one of the, the great challenges for, you know, cultural districts or, you know, cultural organisations in the same way of, you know, trying to democratise that very special experience of the, the three, four Michelin star. You know, one of the things we did in our arts district is purposely put it around a public high school. By putting it around a public high school where it's a, a performing arts center, and you now have parents, young kids that are part of that. So how you plan the edifices are important as well. Mm -hmm. Michael, another issue in Hong Kong is people just weren't used to going to arts events. Um, they sort of didn't know what they were is the sense I get. So how do you combat that? I think what we've had to do is consciously say that you know, the buildings and you know, the cultural district will provide something into the future, but what we really had to start doing was establishing the sense of what it was about. So we started doing music festivals, we started doing weird events like the Poon Choi, we built bamboo theatres on the site, which is a traditional form of, of um, housing you know, Chinese opera. And, and getting people to come there. You know, we've, done, we've got a visual arts event, a blow up um, visual arts pieces. You know, we've you know, put them on the site for eight weeks. We've had 200,000 people come and, and experience what is the visual arts. One of the pieces is an American artist, 16 metre pile of poo uh, by the American artist Paul McCarthy. And clearly that was quite a controversial thing to to put in as the centrepiece of a visual arts exhibition. But what it started to do is encourage a debate about what is art, what is good art, um, you know, do we like the arts, do we you know, think the arts have a role in society? And you know, they're the sorts of things that I think are really important to you know, bring the people with you and you know, to be able to then create some expectation of what the buildings and the rest of the site is going to be about. Alex, for democratization of play, can street food be a way forward? And is it a way forward? It is. It is a way to sensibilize kids, first of all. Realize people how much important it is not a feed, it's fun. This is it. Food can be very funny. Share, see. One of the red, most, uh, most, uh, famous recipe that I have in Dom is just mashed potatoes with cheese. As a dish, it's a very kids tasted, kids dish. And I, if I send for you, if you guys come to my restaurant, and I serve to you a white dish with a white puree, potatoes and cheese, that means nothing. But if this, this, this cheese is there's the right temperature, and the server make big, long movements, and take this, and rouse the table, and <laughs> sorry, serve you like this, and you like this, and exactly the same portion. This is create much more than food. This is create scene. This is create fun. This is create interaction. And I think and that's this, really important. I the, think the idea that you could go to the arts and not eat and drink or, you no. Know, I think it's really important that you've got to think about it as a playful, fun experience. You know, the idea that it shouldn't be just seen as a chore or, you know, something that you're going to learn something from. Yes. And, and I think that's where, you know, one is having to adapt. That, you know, to adapt to, you know, the way that you put things on, the way that you, you build the venues, you've got to be able to incorporate the idea. I think South Bank in London is a really interesting example. We, you know, you, there was nowhere you could really eat there for the first 50 years of its existence. And then we put in 15 restaurants, and now it's, I think, the fourth most successful dining destination in London itself. And it's a much better experience. We get many more people, very different experiences that they can share. And, you know, it helps you know, the restaurateurs survive, it helps the artists survive. And if you go one step forward, 
once you tease someone to cook, you can provoke a, a reflection, not only about food, but the wastes. What is the, our relation with the, with the garbage? People used to select what is recyclable and what is organic, and just put out of your drawing. Where goes this? Kids must learn. It is, sorry, but in my personal point of view, it's too late to change our, our generation. I didn't believe that we are gonna change. Next generation can really change. And they can change if we start to show to them how to work better ingredients and provoke less waste and try to understand what goes forward and what goes back. This balance is so important for, for, for a city. Food is not a, food, food, food can be also a way to provoke reflection. This is my, 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 my point of view. You know, I like this notion of, of the bridge, food being a bridge between democratization and high culture too. In Dallas, it's fascinating because we've got this thing called the Texas State Fair. Now, it, it's, a, it's a tradition in the United States to have county and state fairs. We've got the biggest one in the nation. We have a million and a half people come every year. The reason they come is to eat and drink, okay? I mean, they, they, there's rides and there's games and stuff, but they eat fried food, okay? Everything is fried, okay? Fried corny dogs, and there's a contest every year. We, a couple of years ago, fried beer won, and you know, just imagine all the things you can fry. And then so they, so they fry it and they drink beer and it's great. So what's happened, and in fact, we had a disaster this year. We had a, a big paper mache, a big, big tex that was built in the, the 70s. And he was very hokey and very corny and he burned down. He burned down to the ground. And, but I realized how important this was. This was like our 9-11 that, you know, I mean, that, that big tex died and people were, but what has happened are, are Stephen Pyle, Kent Rathburn, some, some top chefs have taken some of those foods and now turn it into high cuisine and people pay a lot of money for those things done, you know, a duck enchilada done in the right way, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting how cultures grow up and then it can provide a, another level with that. And it's fun. I mean, the whole point is let's have fun in this. This is about play. Yeah, let's not take it too seriously. One question for me before I throw it open to the audience. Isn't it still the case that every young aspiring artist in the US dreams of living in New York or maybe LA? I mean, how hard is it for Dallas to get those people to come and make art in Dallas? Well, it's definitely the challenge that we've got in front of us now. We are, we're coming into our own. Uh, we have some differentiation that those folks have. But right now, my daughter's an artist. She lives in Brooklyn, okay? And I long for the day to get her back to Dallas. And, and she says, we've got to have affordable house. There's more affordable housing there. There's more affordable uh, gallery space. We've got to build up the, uh, the retail side of this. Because inherently, there is uh, uh, the, uh, the audience is important for this. And so that's what we're working on. We've got great musicians. We've got great filmmakers. We've got great actors. So we've got that and we're working on the uh, visual arts side of the thing. But that's our big challenge to, 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 to drive that. But as I said, uh, as Santiago said, uh, we're about this for the next 20, 30 years. Let's have some questions from the audience. If you could briefly introduce yourself before asking your question. I think there's a microphone somewhere about. I can't see any hands. Please raise your hand if you want to ask something. Um, I still can't see any hands, unless I'm missing something. There's a hand up there. Okay, there apparently is one, although hard to see. Please. Um. Excuse me. Hi, my name's Luke Barbara, and I'm from the U.S. I live here in Sao Paulo for three years now, and work with training, but this question's about food, which is another passion of mine, and, and being healthy. So we talk a lot about play today. You know, we talked about fried food at the, at the Texas State Fair, elephant ears, I've enjoyed all those things like that. How does play factor into creating a healthy city? 
Who wants to tackle that? I, I will start because I think it's all about open space and green space. Uh, as I said, I, I talked about this Trinity corridor and we are creating, uh, we've created throughout the whole city 100 miles of bike and hike trails uh, and, and we, we're making sure that we've got a, 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 an Audubon Center that is recycled land and uh, it it's learns about uh, uh, you know, sustainability. We're creating an uh, equestrian center. We're, we're creating uh, lakes in that area. So to me, we, you can kill two birds with one stone because the minute you do that, you inherently become healthier. And at the same time, you add value to your city because uh, the real estate values go up and, and like. So public spaces are extremely important. Right next to our arts district, we created a park out of air and it was literally a highway underneath and we built the park over the highway so we could have green space downtown. We've spent over $160 million in the last eight years in, in parks just in our small downtown. So uh, that's the first uh, place that I would go. My personal point is, when we talk about uh, healthy, Sustain, sustainability looks boring, blaming ourselves. And there's lots of uh, bad feelings on it. We, 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 we accuse ourselves. Why not change this, the, the, the cultural point of view? Why did not we make this fun? Why we didn't teach women or kids who work at home to cultivating carrots and made a salad with us. Why we have flowers and we didn't have vegetables? My kids, I used to, to, to we have a small garden at home and we used to plant few things. And I used to travel quite a lot. And sometimes when I went back home, my son, my youngest son, uh, he loves when I went back home and he, the first thing that he, he asked me is, where's my gift? I blame myself. I'm traveling, I'm out of home. So, my way to express my love to my son or to take a little bit of my, my yeah. blame, it's my guilt, thank you, it's, it's giving, a, giving a gift to him. It's a kind of corruption. <laughs> let, let, yeah, let, let's be clear, let's be clear. And we start to plant, and one day we, we, we planted tomatoes. And one day I went back home after a long trip, and my son bring me his gift. It was just a really beautiful tomato. <laughs> this is healthy. This is healthy. That was a real gift. <coughs> Change the values. This is possible. Here in Brazil we have, we have a beautiful thing called Tamar. Tamar is an is a, a ONG to protect the, turtle, the, 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 the marine turtles. And it's a huge success. His success is not uh, protecting a beautiful turtle who is charming, sweet. Uh, the secret or the key of the secret well, is the cultural interpretation who the fishermen on this area are, have been open to change. For them, one live turtle means much more than one dish of food. So protecting the turtles in there, real change, everything. This is, this is my inspiration to try to talk with people and why, why we must blame ourselves to go to a market and take a, 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 a milk. This is, this is not healthy. This is, can be much more healthy that means we take kids and take regular people and show to them how beautiful is working on the nature and nature gives you back flavors. This is, this is so my personal point of view is, is give, give more charming in this relation with, with as a chef, I must have said, nowadays urban chefs lost this connection of, a, 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 of the, the, the main ingredient. If I came here with my beautiful chef's whites, my beautiful 
knife, very sharp and knife, and a nice white chicken, and cut it, the head. <laughs> Bloods in everywhere. First of all, it can be, looks like Tarantino. <laughs> this can be, uh, but this is choking. This is, this, is not, this, is not, this is not a pleasurable. But my grandma used to do, your grandma used to do, why we have this in our memory as a romantic thing. When I order, when I take, well, sometimes I, 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 I'm, I'm a professional chef six days at least a week. The seventh day, my, my Sunday, I don't want to cook. Sometimes I take my phone and I order, please, may I have uh, six fried chicken wings? <laughs> it's normal. Everybody used to do this, even a professional chef. Four have six fried chicken wings. I need three entire chicken. Where goes the feet, the liver, the head, the breast, everything. The, rela the human relation with food must be revealed. This is the, the, there is few simple things that we used to do in our quotidian life, in our daily life, that can be really, really, really powerful for, for, for the future, for the next generation, and for a few years' time even. I, I believe that few benefits we can, we can achieve in five, ten years of time if, if we start to change right now. Chef and the philosopher of food, I see a hand up there. A gentleman over there in the middle uh, part of the section. Oh, uh, oh, I'll wait. Well, if somebody else already has a microphone, it's, then... I, I have a mic, but I can wait. No, go ahead. If you have the mic, and then he'll be... All right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thanks, guys. This, this was fun. Um, I think the, the topic of play, is, well, important, is a bit limited, because... Um, this, I mean, art, or uh, whether it's in food or in other type of form, uh, is very important for a place to be productive, livable. I, uh, I, I work at, um, at a university in Boston, and my best engineers come from backgrounds in social sciences. Uh, how far do you think is a day where this is viewed as more than play, as a basic sort of thing that needs to happen for any city to become productive, livable? creative because when you're creative you create you attract the good people that then make the city better etc etc my best engineers are musicians and you now it's very helpful when you're trying to take on a project of the scope and scale that i'm trying to do to have some people who actually understand what it is you want at the end of the tunnel so i you know take your point i think you know clearly all of us need you know, other parts of our lives other than, you know, the work side. And, you know, I think it's great to, you know, be able to know that we, you know, can have the food side, the art side, the sports side from that point of view to, you know, to help us cope with, you know, the everyday dramas. Yeah, I read a book um, that, that showed a mathematical correlation between those that um, uh, had gotten patents and uh, their participation in the music, music and the arts. Yeah, yeah. That they, they were more productive in, in doing that to, to that end. I, I don't know what I would do without my sport. I mean, really, I mean, you, know, you work hard, but you want to just, you want to go to another place every once in a while and root for your team. Or, uh, you know, my wife says that anything rolls, I'll watch. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, there is that uh, aspect that I think it, you, escapes what you're doing in day to day. And, and you now, if you look at doctors, I think it's fascinating that most doctors can play the piano better than most of the rest of us. And I think that's a very good thing. If someone's playing around with my old heart or my leg, I'm very happy that they're adept on the ivories as well as uh, you know, good with you, the instruments. You know, the other point, though, is accessibility. We talked about democratization, but accessibility. Your kids need to be able to get sport, you know, or activity or creativity once a day or, you know, five times a week. You know, the parks need to be near you or they've, we've got to make sure schools are providing that um, because um, going to, 
you can create some dull boys pretty quickly, and, and I think that's part of the planning process. Another one or two questions. I promised somebody in the middle there. there. Uh, it was his turn. Yeah. Hello, my name is uh, Lasse. I work for Greenpeace. I'm a Danish national, but I live here in Sao Paulo. I wanted to talk a bit about the origin of food as well in the context of making things funny and interesting. Um, one of the biggest things we're trying to deal, now, deal with in the mega cities is where we source the food from. One of the growing trends is about um, urban agriculture and peri-urban agriculture. It's becoming more and more uh, interesting. Uh, just a few weeks back here in uh, Sao Paulo, we had this uh, week of uh, agroecology, Semana de Agroecología, which was quite interesting. At the same time, the same week, there was a big meeting of the different prefectures of uh, Sao Paulo getting together to talk about having a joint strategy on, uh, on ecology for Sao Paulo as, as a city, but also in the different prefectures, based on the pr principle of uh, differences of approach, but unity of purpose. Now, this all sounds a bit boring, and I used to work a lot on agriculture and genetic engineering, so this is a passion of mine, but also about trying to make this fun. So I wanted to ask, yes, how do we create big cities like Dallas, like Sao Paulo, and like Sydney, incentives for making uh, ecology and, uh, and uh, and uh, trying to embrace the, the sourcing of the food funny. How do we bring that into to cities? To change over time, like the discourse about it, so we create incentives for different procurement policies and so forth. But most of all, how do we ensure that the, the uh, policy makers embrace this to try to make it funny for people to engage in agroecology? Who wants to tackle that briefly? I think the chef would chef, be yes. <laughs> Good point. I, I want to start before the chef, and it's people like him that help do that. You need mythic characters that speak up on that. You know, because guys in suits have a tough time, but if you can make it more fun, and it's, I think it's great. Uh, uh, I love travel, and sometimes, when I, when, I, when I travel around the world, I love to take a public uh, transport. And sometimes you went to, to over busy metro in, in, in a subway in, in, in the US, and you are walking in the corridors and you listen to a nice music. And you go there, and there's a guy asking for a little money, but sharing the, his music with everybody. Didn't, doesn't matter. No, nobody's, it is not compulsory for the money. Sometimes you are, you are walking on a, on, a, on a nice square and guys are dancing for free, or playing soccer, or playing basket, and make tricks. Why we didn't put food on it? And why we didn't try to, to pass a, one more message or a subliminary, subliminary message with food or with the sports or with arts? This is important. In, try to see the whole chain. It's important because this guy who sometimes is playing uh, saxophone on, 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 a, on a subway or playing soccer, there, he has a normal life as well. It's just one, it is few minutes, few hours of his life. He, he, he gave to share his passion. But there is a before, and we must just say this, and this before. People are more happy when they share the passions. This is, this is a, the, the real mean. So if, if, if maybe we, we couldn't pass this, this, this beautiful thing to share the passion, maybe we can, we can give a more charm, a charming message on. One last question, please, a brief yeah. question. It's over there. Uh. Um, I'm very aware that no, uh, yes. lady, not a single woman has asked the question. I, uh, um, I think there's an imbalance. How about this lady at the front? Him first. Okay, well, brief, two brief <coughs> questions then. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> My name is Lucas. I'm from Sao Paulo as well. And by the morning, we had uh, uh, Odete Grageu from Nossa São Paulo talking about IRBEM, which is an index of wellness in the city. And the last report from Sao Paulo said that 56% 50, of the population of Sao Paulo, if could choose, would leave Sao Paulo. 
Uh, also, the UN, uh, through the health department, said that uh, Sao Paulo is one of the biggest mental diseases uh, cities in the world with the most cases. Uh, at the same time, we have a culture in Sao Paulo for the last century of the pogino. Everything that youth try to do in the public spaces or cops or the uh, private security said, Pode no, which means you can't. So how can we create a culture to encourage creativity, not from institutions of NGOs, but from the regular people that wants to occupy the public spaces and play uh, and create uh, new things? Somebody very, very, it's very fast. Um, just Michael. quickly, I, it's a similar problem, I think, in Hong Kong. The idea of public space has never really been used in that way. It's always do not do this, do not do that. And I think that's a particular problem with young people, that if you keep on telling them that, then you just don't know what the consequences of that are going to be. I think it requires leadership. And you, know, you have to be able to get out there and say, we want this space or we want this institution to be open and you know, different to the ways that they've been run before. I think it's probably the biggest challenge to the arts, culture, entertainment business, how you try and, and, and I would include the food business, how you deal with that problem to engage young people in the future. I think it's incredibly important. Okay, this, this lady's question, please. Um, excuse me, sorry, it's your turn. <laughs> There you are, second row. Le the lady with the microphone is coming. First, uh, thank you, Atala, so much for what you do for the gastronomy of Brazil. It's an honor. And my question goes to you, two things. One of them, uh, I, I'm also on, on the hospi hospitality and, and, and uh, restaurant business, and we have a very difficult to find professionals to work in a restaurant. I want to know if that's just my problem and a few other friends, or if you run on that too. And what Sao Paulo is doing to, to better that. We have a lot of fantastic young kids that have no future that could be directed to that. And I know Senaki does a little bit in other schools too, but very little than what it could be done. The other thing is our serious problem with the uh, arrastões, the, the restaurants being... being uh, at a, a mercy of crime, and, and we have in certain restaurants that uh, we got like 35 to 45 less customers than we used to have, even though Sao Paulo is a wonderful gastronomic uh, city. And I would like if you could comment a little bit on that. And also for the mayor of Dallas, uh, we do, when we have those big events in Brazil, like Virada Cultural, at the day after, we got three people dead, and, and there's a lot of confusion. So uh, how could we manage that a little better? And uh, so those big uh, encounters will be uh, a fun and happy from A to Z and from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Uh, many questions. Very brief answers, please, from Alex and okay. then Mayor Rawlings. Brief. Just, just to answer or to talk about La, the, the, the Lucas question and completing what uh, Mr. Michael said. We always listen, do not do this. Why not listen? Please do what you want on this time and this time. Because in the restaurant business, we can't say, I don't want to do food for you. <laughs> we must accept the direct, we must do hearing first to think. And this is my personal point of view of what I said. Uh, about, uh, about formation, I still believe that we didn't have we didn't we, we, we have a, it's true we, we, we didn't have a, a, a big schools from for, from from professional formation, but uh, I believe Brazilian people are very open to learn, and I still believe that training is the key of the secret. So one sportman or or, or athlete or a so soccer player, if he didn't play every day, he not will be good. So practicing is the key. So I, I, as a chef, I'm really training 
my guys, and not only on the, on, 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 on the cuisine, and all his stuff, and even my hostels, because if my staff, is, my, 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 my room service are perfect, my kitchen are brilliant, and someone arrives in the restaurant and someone says, what do you want here? This is a better way to receive. So we must to share it. Da, 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 da. Few people mm. felt themselves important and cherish the customer. And if you want to cherish the, the, the customer, cherish your team and train your team. So uh, violence in Sao Paulo, all big cities got this problem. All human, all, all, all human agglomerations has problem. There's two ways to, to, to change this. One is start to think, oh God, uh, another way is take one attitude. Talk with the, with the, with the majors or the, or the policy or the, uh, and make the things happy. People are less aggressive when they are harmonic and happy. This is so simple. Do you want to say something just very quickly? No, I think it's, it's good. Uh, uh, it's probably a good way to end that we want to play, but we want to do it safely. And how we uh, learn how to do that uh, with public safety is job number one of a mayor. We've got to keep people safe. And when you do that, people have more fun. And so it's, it's on my heart and mind all the time. Well, thanks very much to the panelists. Uh, very briefly, I'll try and summarize a couple of the themes. To be a great city, it's not enough to be a business city. You need to be a play city as well. And there's many synergies between art and food, between um, health and play. And you have to throw it open. You have to keep thinking of ways of getting the people into the opera house who wouldn't normally go. So thank you very, very much to Michael Lynch, Alex Asala, and Mayor Mike Rawlings of Dallas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Simon, Mayor Rawlings, Alex, and Michael. That was really fun. I don't know about you, but I'm slightly hungry after this panel, but anyway. Um, we um, have some great sessions for our final stretch of the New City Summit here in 2000, 2013. We've got some great sessions this afternoon on what works, a fantastic session on the creative city with our friends at Frog, and a very important session on mega events. Uh, that starts at 4, and then I'll ask you to be back here at 5.25 for our final plenary panel, which is on the theme of inclusion. It's called Include. Very, very good panel. And then we will close, and we'll have a little surprise for you at the end of the day. So enjoy the afternoon, and thank you again very much, panelists.